Okay, um, it's a pleasure being here again. Uh, today, I want to uh, concentrate on the effect that the sun has on climate. Uh, it's more interesting for me to uh, study uh, how this effect comes about, and uh, it's related to the introduction that uh, Wolfgang uh, mentioned. Um, he mentioned uh, the study of uh, the effects of cosmic rays on uh, climate and the passage through the galactic spiral arms. So I won't tell you much about it. Uh, if you're really curious, uh, you can ask me uh, later on. Anyway, the, the reason uh, cosmic rays are interesting is because they are the link that links uh, the uh, solar activity with the uh, climate here on Earth. And this is what I want to uh, discuss. Okay, so... Uh, basically, when you leave uh, at the end of the talk, I want you to take away the following uh, points. I want you, uh, and of course, uh, it's my burden to prove to you that uh, uh, these points are indeed uh, what describes reality. Uh, the first thing is that the sun has a large effect on climate. Uh, the second point I want you to take is that because solar activity increased over the 20th century, it means that a large part of the warming is actually not because of human activity, but it's because of increase in uh, solar activity. Um, and uh, once you realize that, uh, this fact goes hand in hand with a, a climate which has a small sensitivity. Why is that? Because if uh, the warming over the 20th century is partially due to humans and partially due to solar activity. It means that the total change in the energy budget is much larger. It's also because of the sun. And it means that in order to understand what has been going on over the 20th century, you have to realize that the climate sensitivity is small. Now, if the climate sensitivity is small, it means that a future warming is going to be small as well under, say, uh, the same emission scenario under a vanilla flavored emission scenario where we don't do much. Um, so these are the main points I wanted to take. Uh, a related point is the fact that this link arises from uh, the, the, the fact that solar activity modulates the flux of cosmic rays of high energy particles which reach the, um, the uh, solar system and uh, this would be the subject of the next talk by Professor Svensmark. So the physical link itself is going to be the, part, uh, the subject of the next talk. Okay. Uh, so let's start with uh, the sun and its effect on climate. How do we know that the sun has a large effect on climate? Okay, so first of all, we have to realize that the sun uh, is an active star. It changes its activity, and this activity manifests itself in different forms. For example, the amount of UV changes by a factor of two or more, depends on which uh, wavelength. Uh, so here, for example, you see uh, what the sun looks like when it's less active or more active. Um, and it has to do with the fact that the uh, magnetic field structure uh, changes, uh, the fact that the outer part of the solar system or, uh, sorry, of, the sol of the sun is convective. It's like... Um, like a soup, which mixes and forms this magnetic field. And it also manifests itself in a change in the what's called the solar wind, which is the mass which uh, the sun loses all the time. And this is important because this is the um, link which uh, links between solar activity and uh, the cosmic rays, which is what we'll see next in the next talk. Okay, so how do we know that this uh, solar activity it translates into changes in the climate. We can look at the records. Here we see probably one of the nicest uh, such correlations. Um, at the top, we have carbon-14 recovered from uh, tree rings. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. It's formed in the atmosphere by the uh, spallation of cosmic rays. We have high-energy cosmic rays coming from outside the solar system. They reach the atmosphere, they break a uh, the oxygen and nitrogen into uh, either as, uh, other as isotopes. And carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope which is formed this way. It's then uh, oxidized, it becomes CO2, uh, it's breathed by the, uh, by the trees, and you have uh, in the tree rings a record of how much cosmic rays reach the Earth as a function of time. 
Now, on these uh, timescales of several thousand years, this record is basically a record of solar activity, so we can see how the sun has changed its activity by modulating this uh, carbon-14 production. At the bottom, you see the ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 in uh, stalagmites, uh, in this case, in a cave in Oman, uh, in the Southern Arabian Peninsula. And uh, what this tells us is basically, or oh, this is a proxy of the temperature of the Indian Ocean. Why is that? Uh, water with oxygen-18 is heavier than water with oxygen-16. So the evaporation rates from the ocean is, um, is different for the two types of isotopes, but the ratio um, is temperature-dependent. So we get a, the, the, um, the, the ratio of the isotopes is a climate proxy, and in this case, it's the temperature of the Indian Ocean, which is where this monsoon uh, water forming the stalagmites came to begin with. So you see, you have a correlation between solar activity on one hand and a correlation between uh, and uh, um, climate on the other, and you see a very nice uh, correlation between the two. So it means that uh, Earth's climate affects solar activity. No, just kidding. I was. I just wanted to see whether you're paying attention. Uh, it's unlikely that solar activity is affected by Earth's climate. It's more likely that it's the opposite. Okay, here, this is another example, this time from the Northern Atlantic. You see, uh, again, the carbon-14 uh, from two rings in uh, blue, and then in black, you see a marine record which shows you whether it was colder or warmer in the Northern Atlantic. Basically, what happened is that uh, ice collects uh, dust, and then as it floats uh, further south, it melts and it leaves the dust. And if it's colder, you get this... Uh, Thus, the positions further south. So, if you take cores from the seafloor, um, you can see whether it was colder or not, wh whether you see this dust or not, this ice rafted debris. So, again, you see this very nice correlation. So, you know that the, uh, the, the climate in the Southern Arabian Peninsula is modulated by solar activity, Atlantic, and you have other such examples from all across uh, the Earth, which shows you that it's a global phenomenon. Okay, uh, here uh, on shorter time scale, you see again that the sun affects the climate. In uh, red, you see the 11 year solar cycle. 11, uh, every 11 years, the north and south magnetic uh, poles of the sun switch uh, sides. And this translates into a modulation in the uh, solar wind and other uh, solar uh, parameters. Um, so this you see in red, and in blue you see the rate of change of the sea level. Now on short time scales, most of the sea level change is because of heat going into the oceans and causing the oceans to uh, thermally expand or contract. So on these short time scales, not only do you see that there is a very clear correlation between solar activity and climate, you can actually quantify the effect that the sun has. Uh, you, for example, uh, you can see that between solar maximum and solar minimum, uh, there's a given uh, change in the um, uh, energy budget, and this energy budget translates into a uh, one watt per square meter change. Uh, this is important because it's much louder than just the changes in the irradiance that the sun has, so it shows you that the sun has a very large effect on the, on the climate. You can quantify it, and you can see that because it cannot be uh, due to changes in the solar irradiance, it has to be some other kind of an effect, um, which today we know is through cosmic rays. Okay, uh, this is uh, more uh, uh, data on the sea level. So this is the sea level uh, with the linear trend removed, because on long uh, timescales you have the melting of uh, ice, because it did warm over the 20th century. Uh, but if you remove this trend, you see that uh, the sea level ch uh, change uh, it can be very nicely explained by uh, changes in solar activity and uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, these two things really uh, explain almost all the variations in the sea level, uh, showing you that the sun is a major um, a player. Um, is a major player. Uh, this is other data. Uh, this time, instead of using the sea level, you can use uh, the ocean heat content. Uh, there are 
three-dimensional uh, or maybe four-dimensional, you can measure the temperature of the oceans at various depths over time. Um, so you have basically a three-dimensional temperature map over time. You can integrate it and get what is the total heat that you have in the oceans every given uh, instant, differentiate it and get the flux uh, going into the oceans every solar cycle. And again, you see that uh, you basically follow uh, the solar activity. So this is additional data uh, which shows you consistently the same results. Uh, here you see again uh, the solar activity, uh, this time uh, proxied by the cosmic ray flux reaching the Earth. This is in red. And in blue, you see the amount of low altitude cloud cover. So now you see another variable, you know, climatic variable, which changes together with solar activity. Um, you can uh, use satellite measurements to quantify the change in energy budget associated with this cloud cover, and you see that it's a, a, the same one watt per square meter that you see um, in the heat going into the oceans. So we know that the change um, in solar activity translates into a change in the energy budget on Earth, and we see also uh, that the culprit is the change in cloud cover. Okay, so you can uh, look at the ch uh, solar minimum to solar maximum changes in the energy budget. Um, I showed you the tide gauge records and satellite altimetry and uh, cloud variations. You can also use, um, oh, and also the heat content. Uh, you can also use the sea surface temperature and get exactly the same uh, values. And all these are independent data sets consistently showing you that the sun has a large effect on climate. Uh, on the other hand, if you just look at what are the total changes in the solar irradiance, it's, it's minuscule, it's much smaller than that, showing you that you must have a large effect um, uh, or some other effect affecting the climate. And again, we know that it's uh, through cloud variation. Okay, so you need an amplification mechanism. Um, why is that interesting? It's interesting because over the 20th century, if you look at the solar activity, you see the 11-year solar cycle, but uh, it increased over the 20th uh, century, and therefore, if the sun has an effect on climate, this increase in activity should translate into a positive forcing over the 20th century, something what, that uh, we have to take in the climate models, but this is something which is missing with all the standard uh, climate models which the IPCC use. Okay, so this is from the, uh, not from the last, this is the penultimate uh, IPCC report. The last report didn't have such a nice uh, graph. Um, uh, here, this is the change in the energy budget since uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and you see that, according to them, this is the uh, contribution that uh, the sun has had. However, because uh, the sun has a large effect on climate, and we've just seen it in five different uh, data sets. The real value should be somewhere around here, and it's comparable with the, amount of, with the contribution of the CO2. Okay, so it's, it's something which we have to uh, take into account. It's the elephant in the room. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the elephant in the other room. Uh, so it's an elephant which is that big, uh, which is just missing, it's ignored. Okay, um, so uh, just a, a, a few sentences, on, uh, it's a promo for the next talk. Uh, today, after 20 years of research, we know exactly how this link comes about. Um, we know that uh, it's through modulation of the cloud cover, and this is basically a very succinct uh, explanation for what happens. Uh, the uh, there, there are particles called cosmic rays. These are high-energy particles which come from the explosion of massive stars, stars which are more massive than about 10 solar masses. They die in a large explosion. This explosion accelerates particles to high energies. They diffuse around the galaxy, and when they reach the solar system, they penetrate the solar wind. Uh, but when the sun is more active and there is a stronger solar wind, less of these particles can reach the atmosphere, so we get a smaller amount of ionization. And today we know that there are several mechanisms which both increase the production of small uh, aerosols and increase the survival of these aerosols as they grow to become 
large cloud condensation nuclei, such that when the sun is more active, we have a stronger solar wind, less cosmic rays, less ions, less formation of uh, condensation nuclei of small aerosols, less survival to larger sizes, such that we form clouds with less cloud condensation nuclei. These clouds are less white, they reflect less of the sunlight, and therefore it's warmer on Earth. Okay, so this is the link, and we'll hear all about it in the next talk. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the fact that um, when you include the, the sun, you realize that uh, part of the warming uh, uh, should be attributed to um, the sun, and uh, over the 20th century warming, it should be attributed uh, because of the sun and not uh, something else, so you can, uh, you can model it. Um, and when you do that uh, and build a model which on one hand is sufficiently complex to include the diffusion of heat into the oceans, this is something which is very important. Uh, sometimes you see people trying to correlate temperature with uh, radiative forcings. Uh, this is wrong, and the reason it's wrong is because the climate system has a heat capacity um, and you have to take it into account. Uh, this is the reason why uh, the same forcing over short time scales gives you a smaller response. This is why you have lags between the drivers and the, and the, um, and the response and things like that. And if you don't take this heat content into uh, account or this um, thermal uh, reservoir, then you, you get inconsistent uh, results. So you need a model which is sufficiently large on one, uh, sufficiently complex on one hand, but you, again, but you also need a model which is flexible enough such that you can play with the radiative forcing and with other parameters which characterize the model, which is something you cannot do with global circulation models because they are just like a, they're like a pot of uh, goulash. You put things in the pot, you let it burn, and then it gives you some taste, but you don't know what gave you this, uh, this taste. Okay. Um, so uh, once you do that, you can actually fit the 20th century very nicely uh, with a residual between the model and the observations, which is typically twice smaller than the residual you get with global circulation models. And the main reason is that uh, it allows the sun to have a large effect on climate, and you can explain things like why between the 1940s and 1970s the temperature on Earth decreased, um, something that you cannot really do with the uh, standard models, which exclude the effect of the sun. Incidentally, in the 1970s, for example, people discussed or talked about the idea that maybe we're entering an ice age because the temperature is decreasing. There is a famous letter that uh, concerned scientists in the US wrote President Nixon, telling him that uh, we're facing an ice age, and uh, you should be aware that the Russians are better prepared. Okay, um, so you get that uh, the fit is much better, you get, that, uh, you, uh, you, you get much better response during volcanic eruptions and so forth. You can then use this model to uh, integrate uh, forward in time with realizations of what the sun would do or what uh, the volcanic eruption would, would do, and you get that the typical increase over the uh, 21st century would be typically 0.15 degree per decade in a vanilla-flavored scenario where we have emission as, a, as, a, a, as a business as usual. Okay, so um, we have seen that if you include the sun, uh, you can explain better the 20th century, um, and uh, part of this warming is because of the sun, and the future warming is going to be benign because in order to explain the 20th century this way, you need a climate sensitivity which is relatively small. So this brings us to the next topic, and that is what is Earth's climate sensitivity, and it's also related to the talk that uh, Professor Scafetta had uh, yesterday. Um, so what is Earth's climate sensitivity? Basically, w uh, the trillion dollar question is, what is a, how much will a temperature increase over, the, say, the 21st century? And for that, we need to know how Earth's response to changes in the energy budget. If we change the energy budget by, say, one watt per square meter, by how much will Earth eventually change its temperature? 
I say eventually because, again, because of the heat capacity, it takes time to reach this uh, eventual re response. Now, the, reason, the, the typical, uh, sorry, the, the value or the number that you see in the literature is not this ratio, but instead it's the change in temperature associated with doubling the amount of, uh, of uh, CO2, which the canonical number is 3.7 watts per square meter. Another interesting thing is that uh, in many cases you don't actually see the sensitivity, you see one over the sensitivity, which is uh, Earth's feedback, and this is by how much Earth's energy budget should change um, if, you, um, a, if you change a, the, the, um, the temperature, for example, the surface temperature by a given amount. Uh, this is interesting because it allows us to separate this response to different processes that you have in the system. Okay, so what is this value? Uh, what is the value for this number? The value for this number, if you open the last IPCC report, uh, you see that uh, basically since, uh, this is the graph from the last IPCC report, since 1979, there was a federal committee that convened in 1979, uh, they tell us that sensitivity should be somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degree increase if you double the amount of CO2. Uh, 40 years later, and uh, billions of dollars and equivalent invested in climate research, and we basically think the climate sensitivity or the uncertainty in the climate sensitivity is as large as we had uh, 40 uh, years ago. I, there, I think very few disciplines in uh, science where so much investment in research uh, led to so little advancement in our understanding. Okay, um, now why is that? Why is it that using climate models we cannot predict what the climate sensitivity is? The reason is that uh, there are a lot of uncertainties and by far the largest uncertainty in, in the climate models is the response of cloud cover. What do I mean? Suppose you double the amount of CO2. If you double the amount of CO2, you will reduce the flux of uh, radiation going back to space and that means that you have to warm the surface in order to reach the same equilibrium that the amount of radiation you get from the sun is the amount of radiation you escapes back to infinity. Okay, so uh, you change the, the, the surface temperature. Now, if you warm the surface, uh, most of the surface is water, you evaporate more water. Water is an excellent uh, greenhouse gas, so it's a positive feedback which wants to increase it even further. However, if you have more water in the atmosphere, you can form more clouds, and clouds can cool or warm the planet. Clouds can cool because uh, they're white, they reflect some of the sunlight. They can also warm because if they're high clouds, they would uh, absorb the infrared coming from the surface and would uh, inhibit the loss of radiation. So uh, this is the situation of models um, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, this is the climate sensitivity or the feedback uh, uh, in the system. So, I, as I told you, they're uh, basically the same number. Um, and you see that um, a most, almost all the models depend on a single variable. And this variable is how much does the energy budget in the model change if you change the temperature. So this is the feedback in the climate model because of clouds. So you see that if you knew how clouds would react, you could predict what the climate sensitivity is. But given that you don't know how clouds react, you don't know the sensitivity. Okay, so basically global circulation models work, um, it's, uh, in, 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 in computer science it's called GIGO, it's garbage in, garbage out. The recipe that you use in order to describe the clouds determines what the climate sensitivity is going to be. Since we don't know that, uh, computer models cannot really predict what the climate sensitivity is. Okay, so this is also from the last IPCC report. This is the feedback parameter um, and w a, a, of the different processes that you have. Um, and this is like the overall feedback. And one over this overall feedback is these numbers here. This is the climate sensitivity. So basically, they tell us that the climate sensitivity is somewhere between somewhat less than two to uh, around five degree increase if you double the amount of CO2. 
And this is the uncertainties that you see here uh, because of uh, how the water vapor changes, how the surface albedo changes, and, uh, and other things. And, but you see that the largest error bar is still that of clouds compared to the error bar that uh, you had in the um, uh, CESSL paper that I showed you from 30 years ago. You see this is the largest error bar, and this is the largest contribution to the uncertainty here. Um, so again, still clouds are the largest uncertainty, even according to the IPCC. Okay, um, here you see exactly why clouds are a problem. Uh, these models are models from the um, uh, CIMIP uh, collection of, uh, of, uh, cloud, of, of numerical simulations. Uh, but these are numerical simulations for special Earths. These are Earths without any land. Okay, so these are simpler uh, planets than Earth. And you see that different models predict different variations in the cloud cover and in the uh, precipitation in different uh, models. So you see that you don't really know or you cannot predict what the cloud cover is going to be because each model gives you a different result. Okay, I hear in Israel, for example, in Israel we live right next to the desert, and people dis say, oh, it's going to, um, there, there's going to be less precip precipitation, there's going to be more precipitation. Well, actually, you, you generally hear less precipitation. But it's, it's ridiculous, these, these uh, um, predictions, because uh, one model can give you that you're going to get more precipitation, and another model will give you at the same latitude that you get less precipitation. Okay? And then if you add the Earth, obviously you really cannot predict what's going to happen. That with numerical models. Okay, uh, you can then, given that climate models cannot be used to predict what the climate sensitivity is, you can resort to empirical estimates for, uh, for the sensitivity, namely look at historic variations in the energy budget on one hand and what Earth's response was. However, you have to do it very carefully because many of these comparisons that you find in the literature exclude the effect that the sun has. So if, for example, you ask the question, what is Earth's climate sensitivity based on a 20th century warming, but exclude the effect of the sun, you necessarily reach the conclusion that the anthropogenic forcing should have explained almost all of the warming, and therefore Earth's climate sensitivity should have been large. But uh, if you take the sun into account, you know that the net forcing is much larger, and therefore the climate sensitivity you need in order to explain the 20th century is much lower. Um, so you can repeat this game for different um, um, time scales, um, uh, whether it's the 20th century warming or the variations over the past half billion years or the warming since the last ice age. Um, and if you don't uh, include the effects that the sun and cosmic rays have on climate, you get a large variation in the climate sensitivity, but if you uh, include all of them, you take every, uh, all of them into account, you find consistently, uh, if you take the sun into account, you find that different timescales give you consistently a climate sensitivity, which is somewhere between one and two degree increase per CO2 doubling. Um, this is more recent results uh, when fitting or trying to model the temperature variations over the past half billion years, and you see that uh, you can build a model which explains very nicely the observed temperature variations over the half billion years uh, using a cosmic rays, a CO2 variations, and uh, you have, of course, to take into account that over half a billion years, solar uh, luminosity actually increased by several percent because the sun is slowly uh, changing its uh, structure. Um, and again, you get also from this time scale a climate sensitivity, which is between one and two degrees. Okay, uh, you can estimate this sensitivity on other time scales. Um, so this is an argument that was raised already by uh, Professor Linsen from MIT. Um, if you look at the temperature variations over the past 20th century and look at uh, the model predictions for model fitting for what has happened, you find that models which, of course, don't include the, the sun, gives you large drops in the temperature following large volcanic eruptions, whether it be Krakatau or uh, Pinatubo or other large uh, eruptions. 
Um, on, on, on the other hand, if you look at or you average the temperature on Earth in the several years preceding large eruptions and uh, after large eruptions, you find that the temperature decrease is typically 0.1 degree. So that shows you that the real response of the climate is several times smaller than the model response, at least those models which don't include the sun and have a large climate sensitivity. Okay, uh, the, you can also use other, other data sets to estimate it. Uh, you can, for example, uh, look at the monthly variations in the energy budget on Earth uh, using satellites and the temperature um, and try to fit a slope. Um, and it's not clear whether you should look at the, diff the monthly differences or the absolute variations in the, uh, in the flux from month uh, to month. Um, there are good arguments to use this one or this one, but both of them, when you uh, give you a range of sensitivities, which is between something which is much lower than unity to a, a roughly 1.8 degree per CO2 doubling. Um, and uh, this is a point mentioned yesterday by Professor Scafetta. Uh, the models predict uh, something which is called uh, the hotspot that over the troposphere, uh, sorry, over the um, uh, uh, um, tropical regions, uh, at the top part of the troposphere, uh, you're going to get a, an increase in the uh, temperature, the, it's the hotspot, um, and it's basically unrelated to the source of the energy variations. It is due to the fact that the, the models have a large adjustment in the atmosphere because they change the amount of water vapor and the, uh, and the lapse rate. Um, uh, so it's basically part of the feedback of the models. Uh, so the models say that there is a, climate, a positive climate feedback uh, associated, uh, and, and the, its signature is the hotspot, but reality is missing this, uh, this hotspot. So we see exactly that the models are oversensitive because their feedback uh, through the, through the um, uh, water vapor uh, is just not there. Okay, so you don't have this positive feedback which gives a large climate sensitivity. Okay, so uh, when you combine everything together, uh, you can integrate over the 21st century and, of course, compare it to um, what the IPCC uh, model predictions are. And, but because the climate sensitivity is on the low side, the predictions are uh, benign. The temperature increase is not, is not going to be very large. And you can also compare the temperature increase over the past uh, uh, several decades to the model predictions and again see that uh, it's below the model predictions because the models are uh, overly sensitive. On the other hand, uh, our predictions for what the temperature increase should be is really consistent with the, uh, in this case, it's the satellite uh, data. Okay, so uh, let me summarize. Um, I'll quote Al Gore quoting uh, Mark Twain. Uh, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we think we know, which just ain't so. And that's it. Need a headset?